Good evening, and welcome back to Beacon Baptist Church. And uh, this is our evening service, and I hope that you had a very good, restful afternoon, spending a little extra time with your family on this Lord's Day. We want to continue to pray for one another, and I encourage you, if you have a prayer need, or maybe you have a physical need, to email that uh, need to us at the church, or text it to us, or call. And if no one is here to answer your call, you can leave a message on the machine. But we want to know what's happening in your life as far as uh, prayer requests go. And so please reach out to us and uh, help us to know how to better pray and help you. And we want to we want to continue to think about one another during this time of isolation. Well, if you have your Bibles there at home, and I trust that you do, go with me to the book of James. And for the last uh, two or three Sundays, we've been in, on Sunday evenings, the book of James, and in James chapter 1. And uh, we talked about, in James chapter 1, so far, this idea of temptation or trials and how to get through those things and how they come about and all of that type of thing. And then we, last Uh, Sunday evening, we talked about uh, wisdom and how we can have wisdom and our need for wisdom. And being a very practical book, James deals with these, what we're calling pressure point uh, subjects. Very controversial sometimes, uh, the book of James. And uh, tonight is going to be another one of those pressure point subjects that really gets to the very core, the very heart of our Christian faith. Now remember, James is being written to believers, and it's not a book about how to get saved. If you want to know how to get saved, read the Gospel of John uh, or the book of Romans. Uh, But James is a book that deals with the Christian life. Now there's nothing more (laughs) uh, fundamental to life at all, whether it be Christian or non-Christian, but there's nothing more fundamental at the core of our life than our money. And so tonight I want to speak on that subject, a man and his money. And James deals with money here in James chapter 1, beginning in verse 9. The Bible says, Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it with withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Let me share with you three ideas tonight, if I can, about a man and his money. Now, ladies, if you're feeling like you're left out, you could retitle this message, A Woman and Her Money. And uh, this applies to all of us equally. But before we go any further, would you ask God to be an encouragement both to me and to you and to everyone who is watching? And would you pray with me? And would you pray also for me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for an opportunity through this digital format to come into your presence and to come into a place where we can study your word and hear your word being taught and preached. God, we thank you for a church that is trying to do everything it can practically uh, to help others during this time of need. I thank you for the many who are watching who have uh, took it upon themselves to call others and to encourage them and to remind them of these live streaming uh, broadcasts and to uh, check in on people in our church. And I've gotten a lot of good feedback about people doing that, and it just warms my heart, encourages me to know that people are doing that in our church. Lord, I pray that you would continue that and that our spirit would be one of unity, even in this time of uh, separation and social distancing. And we pray, God, that you would be glorified in our church, even during this time. May we find a way through this time of crisis to be an encouragement to our community at large and uh, exalt you in some way in our community. We love you now, we praise you. Speak to our hearts concerning this practical issue of money. In Jesus' name, amen. A man, a woman, and their money. 
Three things tonight, if I can give them to you very quickly. Let's talk, first of all, about the issue of wealth. The issue of <clears throat> wealth. James deals with the issue of wealth here in verse 9 and 10. Let the brother of low degree, or in other words, a person who is impoverished financially, let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich or in other words, the wealthy person, in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. First of all tonight, the issue of wealth. James is not commending poverty, nor is he condemning wealth. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that those who are poor are holy, and those who are rich are wicked. The Bible does not condemn wealth or condone poverty. Poverty and wealth are simply a fact of life. Jesus said, the poor shall always be with you, and by default, the wealthy will also be there too. Poverty and wealth is just a fact of life. Some people are going to be poor, some people are going to be wealthy, and there's going to be a whole lot of people in between uh, and in the middle class of life. Now people have many wrong ideas about money. Even Christians oftentimes have wrong ideas about money. For instance, some people think that money is in and of itself a wicked thing. And yet the Bible teaches that money is a neutral thing. It can be used for either good or evil. It is neutral and it is the love of money that is wicked. Ecclesiastes 5.19 the writer says, Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth, and hath given him power to eat thereof, and to take his portion, and to rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. God does not give man wicked things. God does not give a man something that is sinful. He does not give something to a man and then say, Okay, now that you possess that thing, it has made you uh, in this category of a, a wicked a desperate person. No. Money is neutral. A drug dealer can take a, a $20 note and use it for wickedness. That can be taken to the bank and the bank can give that to a, a, a little girl who brings it in during missions conference month or missions conference time and gives it to the work of the Lord and that money can go to the missionary on the foreign field and he can use it to buy Bibles and tracts and to spread the gospel. Money is neutral. It's the hand that holds the money, and it's the, the person behind that money. It's the motive of what that money is being used for that makes it either wrong or right. It's a Money in and of itself is just a neutral thing. So some people think, well, money is wicked. No, it's the love of money, and it's the use of money that determines how it is being, uh, whether it's being used wickedly or righteously. Here's another false idea about money that sometimes even Christians have. And that's the idea that rich people cannot be people of faith. That is simply untrue. How do I know it's untrue? Because, well, the Bible never says that rich people cannot be people of great faith. And secondly, uh, the characters of the Bible teach us that wealth does not determine one's faith. Abraham and his sons were men of great wealth and also of great faith. Boaz, in the book of Ruth, was a man of great wealth, and yet he was a man of great faith and was used to uh, bring the future king of Israel, David, uh, into being. He uh, marries Ruth, and they have a baby, and that baby is, uh, goes on to become the, in the line of David and eventually the line of Christ. Uh, Solomon was a man of great wealth, and yet he was a man of great faith. In the New Testament, we read of a man named Joseph of Arimathea who was used to take down the body of Christ and to, with his own money, purchase a place for him to be buried, a new tomb and an expensive one, I'm sure. And he was a man of great faith. In the book of Acts, chapter 16, we read about a businesswoman who was quite, quite wealthy named Lydia, a woman who was in the textile business and evidently a, a woman of some means and she was a woman of great faith. I think of that man, Laterna, 
who uh, was in the earth moving uh, machine business and he created machines that moved great amounts of earth and uh, he was a man of great faith at one point he was giving 90 percent of his income to the Lord's work he started a Bible college to train men for the ministry and his wife was also very involved in that they were late, uh, a man and a wife of great faith and yet they were also a man and a woman of great wealth it is easy for people to trust in their wealth, and uh, the Bible does address that issue on several instances. But faithlessness is a problem of the individual and not a fruit of wealth. One might be very wealthy and yet not be trusting in his riches, not be trusting in his riches to take him into heaven, not be trusting in his riches to make him uh, better in the eyes of God as a Christian, he may have great wealth and yet have great faith. A poor person, however, might not have much physical wealth and yet also might not have great, uh, be, be not great uh, wealthy in faith. He might have little faith as well and vice versa. It can go either way. Rit, a rich person automatically is not a wicked person. A rich person is automatically not a person who lacks in faith. That is a misconception of wealth. Here's another false idea about wealth. That the poor have an automatic ticket into heaven or are somehow naturally closer to God as a believer because of the suffering they endure through poverty. Now there's a lot there. Basically it's the idea that poor people, because they suffer much on earth through being impoverished, that they somehow, uh, you know, just have it have uh, heaven assured to them because of that idea. I have often heard that as I've gone out soul winning or talked to people. You get talking with somebody and they say something like this, well, I've paid my dues. I've, uh, uh, God will accept me into heaven because I, I have suffered here on earth. Uh, I have gone through it. I have not lived an easy life. And, uh, and uh, because of that, I'm expecting God just to kind of open the doors of heaven to me. That's a wrong idea, folks. Poor people... Uh, are lost and on their way to hell just as much as a rich person who's trusting in his riches. Riches do not exclude someone from heaven and the lack of riches does not guarantee someone an entrance into heaven. No, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. If a man is trusting in his money to get him into heaven, he is trusting in a works, a work to get him into heaven. He is trusting works salvation. If a man is trusting in the hardships of his life and in the impoverished condition of his life to grant him uh, access to heaven, he is also trusting in a works-based salvation. Both of them will die lost. Both of them will go to he hell if they do not change their ways and come to Christ. Because it is by grace that we are saved through faith, not of anything we have done or experienced or gone through. It is the gift of God, not of any work, lest any man should boast. If the rich man can trust his money to get into heaven, the poor man will be able to boast in his hardships. And if you can boast <laughs> about the thing that's going to get you into heaven, that's a work-based salvation. And you, my friend, are lost because we must come to Christ and accept the gift of grace by faith. So, there are some ideas that are wrong about our, our money, uh, that even sometimes Christians or believers or people who go to Christian churches get all caught up with. Money is wicked. No, it's the love of money. Rich people cannot be people of faith. No, that's not true. The poor somehow have a free ticket into heaven because of their impoverished life that they've lived here on earth. No, God doesn't owe the poor anything. They must come by faith. Here's another one, that money can buy happiness. Some people think that if they had money, they'd be happy. Some people with money wonder why they're not happy. Money cannot buy happiness. Again, Ecclesiastes 5 and verse 10, the writer says, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase this is also vanity, emptiness. Uh, one is not satisfied because of his wealth. 
Wealth cannot make one satisfied or happy. Wealth does not buy happiness. You're poor tonight, and you say, if I only had, I would be happy. If I only had a better house, if I only had a nicer car, if I only had nicer clothes, if I only had the freedom to not have to worry about where the school money is going to come from or where the, the uh, retirement money is going to come from. If I was just financially uh, wealthy, I would be happy. No, you might get to that place and you'll find you're not happy and you're going to find you're miserable, always grasping for more. Maybe you are wealthy tonight. Maybe you have worked hard and you have struggled and you have chiseled out a, a, some wealth for yourself. Good for you. But that wealth won't make you happy. That money in the bank won't uh, heal a broken marriage. That money in the bank won't uh, redeem a lost child. That money won't make you happy. And uh, that's a mis misunderstanding and a, and a wrong idea about wealth. So James is not dealing with the idea that poverty is something to commend and wealth is something to condone. So what is the issue of wealth that James is dealing with? James is dealing with the attitude that we have towards our wealth. Are you with me tonight? Look at verse uh, 9 and 10 again. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. But the rich rejoice in that he is made low. Now rejoicing is an action brought on by an attitude. We don't rejoice because of the circumstance we're in. We rejoice because how we view that circumstance. Now, what James is dealing with is the attitude of wealth, and that's the real issue. One can have wealth and have the wrong attitude about it, and what a mess he's going to get himself into. One can be impoverished and poor and have a lack of wealth and have the wrong attitude about that state and that condition, and he's going to be miserable. So what is James talking about? When it comes to wealth, he says, the issue is not whether you have or whether you don't have. The issue is how you view the wealth you have or how you view the poverty that you're in. And look at what he says. Let the poor, he says, have a contented attitude concerning his poverty. And let the rich have a humble attitude concerning his riches. So when we're talking about wealth and how we should deal as believers with our wealth, we must understand it's not an issue of to have or to have not. The issue is how do we view the position that we find ourselves in? I'm poor, let me be content with that place and not be trying to grasp for more and not be trying to always have more. I'm wealthy, let me be humbled into knowing that God has given me something so that I might do something with it for His glory. I'm a steward of His wealth. I'm a servant and an overseer and I'm responsible for the wealth He has given me to be a good steward of that wealth. So, when we're talking about wealth, from a Christian biblical perspective, we must understand we're dealing with an attitude and not a possession or a lack of a possession. We're talking about being content and being humble no matter what position or what state we find ourselves in. So the issue of wealth. But then second of all tonight, let's talk about the introspective, introspective wealth. Excuse me, the introspective wealth. Or in other words, we need to ask the question of ourselves, how do I, uh, do, excuse me, do I have a proper perspective of my wealth? Now let's talk about the person who has wealth. Now this can be any of us because all of us have some wealth. None of us are completely without anything. We have something. The man who has $10 in his pocket and the man that has a million dollars in his bank, they have wealth. This man, considerably less than this man, but nonetheless, this man has something and this man has something. So how do we view what we have? That's what we're talking about in this point. The introspect of our wealth. Having a realistic perspective of our possessions. Okay? This is very important. So I hope you're following along. 
First of all, Job says, we need to understand wealth or what we possess is temporal. Look at what he says in verse 11. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth. The grass is you and me. The flower is what we possess. And the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. What is James saying? James is saying this. Everything you have is going to perish. Everything we own is temporal. Job understood this when he said in Job 21, verse 23 to 26, One dieth in his full strength, being whole, at ease and quiet. His breasts are full of milk, his bones are moistened with marrow. And another dieth in the bitterness of his soul, and never eateth with pleasure. They shall lie down alike in the dust, and the worms shall cover them. Or in other words, they are both going to the same place. The one who has much and the one who has little, they must both understand that they are, are going to die, and everything they have is but for a moment. It is all temporal. In another place, Peter talks about the fact that this whole world and everything we see around us, everything that's physical, everything we can lay our hands on and touch and feel and sense, it's all going to burn up. It's just temporal. We have to understand that everything we own all the wealth that we have is temporal. And we also have to understand everything we lack as a Christian, everything that we would say we're impoverished by, that also is temporal. The one who is exceedingly rich must look at his possessions and say it is but for a moment. And the one who is impoverished with pov and, and poor must also look at that poverty and say, it is but for a moment, for I am an heir with Christ, and, I, and he has made me a king and a priest in the life to come. Wealth is temporal. Something else James talks about. Wealth can cause discrimination. Look at chapter 2. You're in chapter 1 of James. Look at chapter 2. Look at verse 1 of chapter 2. My brethren... Have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons, discrimination, prejudiceness. For if there come unto your assembly, now this is talking about a church, a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to one that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor man, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial, discriminatory in yourselves, and are become a judge of evil thoughts? Not only must we have the right view of our wealth as being temporal, but we must have the right view of wealth when it comes to individuals who are around us. We must not allow wealth to be a cause of discrimination or prejudice or partiality. Oftentimes, uh, we hear of churches who uplift the rich unfairly and who put the poor down and uh, cause them to feel like they're unwanted or unneeded or unloved. Sometimes it's the other way around. Sometimes uh, rich people feel like when they walk into a church that People just want them so that they can become big givers in that church and they just want their money and they don't care about their spirituality. They don't care about their spiritual growth or their walk with Christ. They just want them for their money. James is saying any church or any group of believers who discriminates against someone because of what they have or because of what they don't have or, or prejudges someone or treats someone differently because of their economic standing in the community, that is a wrong perspective of wealth. So wealth is temporal. We must understand that. Wealth can cause discrimination. We must be aware of that, and we must pray that that does not ever become a part of us, that we do not look around at people and say, well, I'm going to view them better or less because of what they have or what I think they'll be able to give 
or their say means more to our church or to me because of what they have. No, we must be careful of that. But then here's another thing. Paul talks about this. Wealth is a state of mind. We're talking about the right perspective of wealth, the right understanding of what you own and the possessions you have. It's temporal. Uh, the danger of wealth is that it can cause discrimination and prejudice, and we have to be on guard against that. But we also must understand that wealth really and truly is a state of mind and not a possession you, you hold in your hand. Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 6, Godliness with contentment is great gain. Or in other words, true wealth is to have godliness and contentment. If you have godliness and contentment, it doesn't matter what, what possessions you have, you are a man of great wealth. He says, he says in Philippians 4.11, excuse me, For I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. True wealth is to be content inside, to be godly inside, and not then to be concerned with what you have on the outside. That's what true wealth is. It's, the, it's freedom from being consumed with the things that you can have, and it's to be free inside, knowing that you're godly and that you are content with what you have been given. That's what true wealth is. It's a state of mind and not a state of possession or a state of physical enrichment. So the issue of wealth that James deals with is the issue of how we view our wealth, our attitude towards wealth, and then the right understanding of wealth is that we understand everything is temporal. Uh, there's a danger of becoming discriminatory or prejudiced based on wealth and what someone has or what we deem someone, someone's value is because of what they own. Wealth is a state of mind. I, will, I have learned to be content. Godliness and contentment is great gain, or, or in other words, great wealth. But then let's, lastly, talk about the investment of our wealth. All right? We understand now how to view wealth and the attitude towards wealth that we should have and how our wealth and the things that we own, how it should be viewed uh, by our spiritual minds. But then what do we do with our wealth? Because it's a fact of life that money and possessions are going to come into your presence, are going to come into your possession. You're going to have things and you're going to have money. What do you do with it? Now, we talked about tithing a few weeks ago, several weeks ago now. And that's not really what I'm going at tonight. We all should tithe, and that, that's a subject that we address and will have to address from time to time because that's a part of our Christian life. But that's not what I'm talking about tonight. I'm talking about what do you do with the wealth that God has given you, the things that God has entrusted you with, the possessions you own. Well, I think for this we go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Go with me there very quickly. 1 Timothy and chapter 6. And I think that there are three things that Paul addresses with Timothy here in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and beginning in verse 17 concerning investing our wealth wisely or in other words, using our wealth properly. 1 Timothy chapter 6 beginning in verse 17. Charge them that are rich in the world or in other words, those who have much that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. That they do good, uh, excuse me, that they do good, that they be rich in, the, in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Three things, very quickly, uh, that... Paul tells Timothy to do concerning his wealth and what he encourages Timothy to teach his people to do concerning their wealth and their possessions. Number one, he tells them, enjoy your wealth. 
enjoy your wealth. That sounds pretty good in verse 17. Charge them that are rich in the world that they would be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. The writer of Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 7 says, Go thy way, eat thy bread with joy, and drink thy wine with a merry heart, for God now accepteth thy works. What was he saying? What is Paul saying? Paul is saying this. God has blessed you with wealth, with possession, with resources. Use it for your enjoyment. Learn to be humble, yes. Trust God, for sure. Work hard. And then enjoy the fruit of your labor. Listen, if you work an honest job and you have gained what you've gained through honest means, there should be no, no shame in that. You should not feel bad about owning a nice home, driving a, a, a reliable car, going on a nice vacation. You should enjoy the wealth and the freedom that that wealth gives you uh, in this life. Because God wants you to enjoy the gifts that He's given you. I like to give gifts to my children. I like to give gifts to my wife. They like to give gifts to me. Uh, we were able to replace the bicycle that, that uh, we left back in Zambia for Hazel. And we went out and we bought her a bike. She's been riding that little bike around town. Or not around town, around our street. And uh, Cyrus's birthday's coming up. And we had an opportunity to get him a bike for his birthday. So he's got one. He's learning to ride the bike. They enjoy it. I like to see them enjoying their gifts. Now, if I gave them those gifts and they took it and they said, oh, okay. And they put it out on the grass and the snow came and the rain came and it rusted and it just, they never used it. Boy, I would sit back and say, boy, what a waste of a gift. They're not enjoying my, the apple of my eye, the love of my life, my children, and my family. They're not using the gifts. They're not enjoying the gifts that I've given them. So it is with God. God says, listen, I'm giving you the opportunity to work and to save and to build a home or to buy a home and to have a car and to go on a vacation and to enjoy life. Enjoy it. So number one, there must be enjoyment. What should we do with our wealth? There, we should enjoy it. Number two, we should learn to be generous with it. Look at verse 18. That they, speaking about those who have something, that's all of us tonight, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. Paul says it this way in Galatians 6.10, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. What is Paul saying to Timothy? What is Paul saying in Galatians chapter 6? He's saying this, Use your wealth to enjoy life. Use your life to help others in life. Be generous. You see somebody with a need, and you have an opportunity to help be the helper that they need. Use that wealth that God has given you, not to hoard it unto yourself, but be a conduit to bless others with that wealth. Be generous. And then here's the third thing. Number one, enjoy your wealth. Number two, be generous with your wealth. Number three, use your wealth for the furtherance of the gospel. Verse 19, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Pastor Rich, are you saying that they can purchase eternal life with their wealth? No, and that's not what Paul is saying to Timothy. But what he is talking about is the fact that there is an eternity, and what he's talking about is the fact that we right now are investing or not investing in that eternity as believers. Listen, we are right now sowing seeds in eternity. Sometimes we won't even know the fruit until we get into eternity that those seeds produce. But we are now sowing those seeds and investing. And what Paul is saying is, take the wealth you have, enjoy it. Take the wealth you have, be generous with it. Take the wealth you have and use it for eternity's sake. Use it for the furtherance of the gospel. In other words, use your wealth to lay up treasures in heaven. There is a treasure that will last for eternity, and that is the soul of men. Paul says, hey, listen, make money and enjoy money and be generous with money, 
and use that money so that you can be free to invest in eternity. You know what we should do with our money? We should allow it to free us so that we can be soul winners. We should use our money so that we can support worldwide missions. We should make money so that we can take it and use it to reach children through uh, supporting and being involved in the Sunday school ministry and in the bus ministry and in the vacation Bible school ministry and in the school ministry. We should take the money we have and we should say, okay, I'm going to use a portion of it to enjoy. I'm going to use a portion of it to be generous. And I'm going to use a portion of it to further the gospel, to further the kingdom of God. I'm going to use my money to further the gospel and to be an aid in helping people when it comes to the things of eternity. The hymn writer wrote, When he cometh, when he cometh to make up his jewels, all his jewels, precious jewels, his loved and his own. And then the next verse says, Little children, little children, who love their Redeemer, these are his jewels, precious jewels, his loved and his own. What was the songwriter saying? His songwriter was saying, The jewels of heaven, the, the wealth of heaven, the, <laughs> the treasures that are eternal, that are in heaven, the crowns that we're going to throw at his feet, all of that is the souls of men. All of that has to do with bringing God glory through bringing people to Christ and exalting God and lifting up Christ so that he might draw all men unto himself. Use your wealth. Enjoy it, yes. Have nice things. Have nice home. Have nice possessions. Use it to be generous with people as needs arise around you. But don't fail to use it to further the gospel. Maybe you are saying, how can I use my wealth to further the gospel? Well, you can support some student who maybe can't afford to come to our Christian school. You can help them by paying a part of their tuition. You can help by giving to missions. You can help by giving to our general fund. We've talked about that with tithing, and we, we're not going to belabor that point, but you, you understand there is a way for you to further the gospel by using your wealth to do so. And when you do, what you're doing is you're not planting seeds here on earth. Maybe you're not going to see any fruit from it here on earth. Maybe you will, but... What you are for sure doing is laying up treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt, where the thief cannot grab it and take it away from you, where it will be for all of eternity to the glory of God. So money and wealth is a part of life. We can't avoid it. We have to earn it. We have to use it. We have to live by it. But... We can understand money in a biblical light. And that's what James is dealing with here. And that's what he's saying when he says there in our text passage, Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. Be content with the place that God has put him. But let the rich in that he is made low, let him be humble before God. Wealth is a state of mind. Godliness and contentment equals great gain, great wealth. God's going to give you wealth. Use it wisely. Use it scripturally. Use it biblically. Use it for His honor. Use it for His glory. A man and his money. Let's pray together. God, we thank you and praise you for the opportunity to have resources that you've made available to us to use and to enjoy and to be generous with and to further your gospel with. May we do these things and may we have a right understanding of money and may we have a biblical perspective of wealth and may you be glorified through the preaching and teaching of your word. We trust that you will be in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't forget, there are opportunities for you to give even in this time of quarantine to our church and uh, you can do that by regular mail to our church here. You can do that online by going to our website, clicking on the donate button, or you can go directly to Canada Helps and search for our church, and you'll be able to find that there. If you have any questions about that, you can contact us through email or phone. And again, continue to pray. 
pray for this thing to be done swiftly. Pray for God's people not to become uh, so discouraged that they give up on God and give up on prayer and give up on the Bible during this time. Be an encouragement to others. Be calling. Be texting. Be emailing. Uh, don't go and visit, <laughs> but do be doing these other things. And, be, and uh, be aware that you are in our prayers and that we miss you and are looking forward to that time that we have together. We'll all be back together again in one place. God bless you.